Okay, welcome back. So this is our second art historical lecture for Unit 11. The first one was just kind of wrapping up modernism. It's titled The Crisis of Modernism and just basically talking about that transition period. And then this one is sort of about contemporary art, about postmodernism, about a number of things. It's got it's actually a number of lectures kind of pieced together. And um, the main the main part of this lecture is actually just a list of contemporary artists, uh, kind of a review lecture I use from a junior seminar class where they have a test on contemporary artists, so essentially like a study guide. And it's just, I'm just going to go through it and talk about some of the contemporary artists in that group. And um, that's a, so it's pretty, pretty informal. Um, but I did want to just cover one thing. I couldn't remember Chris Burden's name for some reason. Had my brain just ended right there. Chris Burden uh, not only famously um, crucified himself to his uh, Volkswagen Beetle, and he also famously had himself shot, but he uh, famously later said that the performance piece that was the most terrifying, most dangerous that he ever did was a piece where he lived on the streets as a homeless person and he was um, accosted a couple of times and at least one time he was beaten so badly um, that he feared that he wouldn't survive and uh, kind of an interesting little tidbit but he uh, eventually went on to make other work that wasn't quite so um, terrifying and so much about bodily harm but definitely at the beginning of his career he was he was obsessed if you remember the end of the beginning and the end of the um, ideological impulse lecture, I talked about this slide and talked about um, how do we explain this art. And I want you to think about this both in terms of the the original, the Bruce Nauman piece. Um, and I think understanding Bruce Nauman in some ways is kind of critical to understanding contemporary art. Um, although I'm not going to show you a lot of, of Bruce Nauman pieces. Um, and this, the, the Matthew Barney piece and Matthew Barney's kind of relationship with the Bruce Nauman piece and then the films that Matthew Barney has made that are kind of about his sculptures and about his performance pieces, even though the films are not, they're completely different. They're very um, fantastical. And I think fundamentally, you know, we talked about how to explain this from the point of view of the, the ideological impulse, but I also think that to a certain degree, how to explain this is really just an issue of aesthetics. How do we understand how someone, how this is an interesting art idea for someone? And I think the best way to do that is to just look at a lot of contemporary art. But before we're going to do that, we're going to take a little bit of time to try to understand kind of as a whole the, um, the differences between Romanticism, Modernism, and Postmodernism. This is a lecture, this little brief small lecture that I use in my junior seminar class. And what I try to do in this lecture is to get um, students to understand the differences. Well, two main points. One, to understand the differences, or at least to get a, a beginning feel for the mood differences between uh, these different types of, of movements. But also to understand that each of these impulses, romanticism, modernism, and postmodernism, are still very much active in contemporary art making. Um, that you can still look at contemporary artists and see to a certain degree um, some connections and some inspirations from um, each of these moments, periods, and each of these philosophical approaches to art. Um, definitely we live in a, in a postmodern or even a post-postmodern world, but that doesn't mean that the ideas of modernism are still not very, very important in our world, and that even the ideas of romanticism maybe are less important, but they still are pervasive and um, just kind of fill in um, the voids when we're not paying that much attention. And so the way this lecture gets at that is that I show examples of pop culture and then try to divide them up in between romanticism, modernism, and postmodernism. The point of this is not to say that, let's say, that Jimi Hendrix is literally romantic, because after all, Jimi Hendrix made music in the 1960s, so that's, you know, over 100 years since the Romantic movement. The point is to say that in this context, you can see romantic, you can see that someone like Jimi Hendrix or, or a band like uh, Led Zeppelin embody more romantic type ideas compared to someone like David Bowie, 
who definitely embodies much more postmodern ideas. So that's how um, that's how this lecture is going to go. So it may be a little bit confusing for some of you because we're going to be talking about art, but we're also going to be just talking about pop culture a little bit. So we're going to. Um, you guys have seen so romantic art, but here's some some new examples. There's a Bierstadt on the on the left, and hopefully you're pretty familiar with that. Uh, the Casper uh, Friedrich on the right, and hopefully you can kind of see now, based on our discussions in the discussion session, you can see how both of these um, embody those kind of romantic ideas, or how a painting like this embodies romantic ideas. But this might be a little bit more surprising to you. This is a scene from the first Lord of the Rings, um, and I feel like this is actually the, the best uh, filmmaking moment in the entire, in all of them, in The Hobbit, all three Lord of the Rings movies. This scene here is the, the high point of, of all of it. This is such an amazing scene, but it is so very gothic in feel, so very romantic in feel, the way it's composed. Everything about The Lord of the Rings, the way um, Jackson directed it and, and composed the shots, definitely has this very romantic uh, feel to it. So, romanticism, um, modernism, postmodernism. And remember, I'm not just talking, um, keep in mind, I'm when I show these examples, I will not be just talking about the characters, not just that Batman himself is to a certain degree romantic, um, but I think, and definitely that is true, as um, as superheroes uh, that were developed in the 30s and 40s, he is definitely one of the more romantic, whereas Superman is definitely more modernist, especially if you think of Superman as being a representation of essentialism, like he is the essential superhero. He is like superhero man, right? He is the embodiment of superhero-ness. But also specifically this cartoon version of a Batman in terms of, is very romantic. Um, this cartoon version of Superman is very modernist in the drawing and the in the, um, the sh just the organization of the compositions. And Teen Titans is, yes, an atrocity, um, but also a very, very postmodern. Okay, modernism. So obviously the Mondrian is from modernism, whereas the uh, Sujitomo is not. But my point here is that um, Hiroshi Sujitomo's work sh reflects a certain kind of modernist approach to art making and to photography. Um, Lavender Mist here by Jackson Pollock, um, and also modernist, although I think you can make the case that you could see um, some aspects of Jackson Pollock's work as re reflecting romantic ideals, and even some aspects of his work that maybe he wasn't even fully aware of that kind of um, re represented what would be future postmodernist ideas. Um, here we have a Joseph Albers, and it's an extremely modernist piece because it's very formalist, right? It's very much a, it's a painting that says painting is just simply the organization of shapes and color. That is what painting is, right? Here's another um, contemporary um, artist who you could maybe say is postmodernist. This is uh, Bryce Martin, but that his work definitely reflects very strongly modernist idealism. So here's another set. In this case, we're talking about 90s uh, rock groups, although well, Beck is not necessarily a group. He's just one, one lone guy. But once again, romanticism, modernism, and postmodernism. If you're not sure who these fellows are, uh, that's Radiohead. All right, so we're going to move on to postmodernism. So um, that'll be in part two. This will probably be a three-part, maybe a four-part lecture. All right, I will see you there.